It's really kind of incredible. You know, I, I work, you know, with the teenagers. And, you know, we throw around the word awesome. We throw around a lot of words, and we detach them from their meanings, you know, like the word love, for example. We love pizza. We love all this other stuff. And we throw around the word awesome, like that's awesome, or this is awesome. But, you know, I think it, 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 the more you spend time around God's word and the more you, time you, you dig into it and the more you realize there's only one person who's awesome. There's only one thing that's awesome. And it, it really waters down the meaning of the word to assign it to other things. Like, that movie was awesome. Well, the Avengers are awesome. That was, it just waters down the meaning of the word. And, and if you read the Bible, you'll find that, that that word's only attached to one person. And it's God. It's God's purposes and his plans. And, you know, I think the biggest travesty in the world is, is that when an awesome God is right with us, when he's close to us, when he, when he engages us, when he enters into our world, that the biggest travesty is that we don't see him. But we do it all the time. We miss it all the time. We're, we're surrounded by his glory everywhere we go. He constantly speaks to us his truth everywhere we go. And, and we miss it all the time. And we, we tend to assign other things as being awesome all the time right in front of God and uh, I just this morning I just I feel like God is just challenging my heart Chuck don't do that don't do that this morning don't don't let anything else move into a place of being ultimate let an awesome God be an awesome God and let everything else kind of come around that and hear what God wants to say and and uh, let God do a work in our hearts that only he can do. Because I think that's what he wants to do right now. I think it's what he wants to do every day. But I think it's what he wants to do right now. He wants to, he wants to speak to our heart. He maybe even wants to offend our heart. And uh, we just need to be open to that. We need to have our hearts soft and tender before him so that he can put his finger on it. And he can say, hey, that's, that's what I want. Because I'm king. I'm lord of your life. That's what I want. Nobody else can demand that from you, but I can. Because I'm king and that's what I want. And so let's just, let's open our hearts up this morning as we kind of look in at God's word in John chapter 5. You know, it's, uh, it's really interesting to, to see the shift here in John. John's been, you know, he kind of opens up just in this glorious way of painting Jesus as the word. And, and he's just God of the universe. He's creator God. And, and then we see him engaging these different kinds of people. And he, he's just offering himself, right? Offering new birth to Nicodemus and living water to the woman at the well. And we just see God just being God, Jesus being God in the flesh and the way he engages people and loves on people and encounters people with who he is. It's just amazing. And then we get to John chapter 5 and, and a shift begins to take. And this shift is going to kind of carry us um, for the next four chapters or so. And, and the shift is, is that Jesus begins to assert. He doesn't just engage people. He just doesn't meet people and start engaging them in, in conversation, but he begins to go and assert himself, and he begins to assert his authority. And it's that asserting of his authority into the lives of people and into situations that causes reaction. Because see, if, if Jesus never asserts his authority, there's no reason to ever get upset with him. If he engages us in, in sweet conversation and, and it's amazing and it's interesting and we talk with him and it's loving and it's all and it's awesome, but if he never at the end of the day says, I'm king, I'm an authority, and I have a right to say what I want to say in this moment. If he never does that, then there's no reason to ever get upset with him. He's just kind of a part of our lives. It's a kind of a nice, sweet part of our lives. But unfortunately, Jesus isn't nice and sweet all the time. Um, uh, actually, fortunately, actually, it's much more fortunate that he's not because in his authority and under his reign, things work out better for us. They work out better for his glory and for our good. But, but Jesus begins to kind of insert himself into situations and into people's lives with authority. And he begins to make certain claims kind of over and over again. He just says, hey, I'm equal with the Father. And that means I have the right to kind of do what I want to do in these situations. And that causes certain reactions. Um, I like getting reactions out of people. If you've been around me long enough, you know that, that I, I kind of, I'm a bully sometimes. Jesus is not a bully, but I'm kind of a bully. And uh, my buddy Andy knows that. I, I like to just bully him. He's kind of nice and sweet, and I just kind of push him around all the time. But, but I like to get a reaction sometimes, just for the fun of it. You know, just kind of see what people will do, how much they can take. You know, 
And uh, I've, some of you guys who know me well know this story. I don't think most of you know this story, but uh, when I was in college, I had this friend named Joe. And uh, Joe was cool. Joe was awesome. And, but Joe had a particular thing he hated. He hated anybody touching his food. He hated that. And, and I knew that. See, I don't care if anybody touches my food. I don't care if anybody touches my drink. I don't care. I'll drink after anybody. I'll eat after anybody. I'll eat it off the floor. I'm the oldest of six kids. I don't care. Okay? Joe cares. You touch his glass, he'll go get another one. You touch his plate, you can have his plate. Okay? So about 7.30 in the morning one time, we were in the cafeteria, and I, Joe, we were eating. There's, it's packed, and it's full, and Joe's sitting right next to me, and He's eating some good biscuits and gravy. It's just, he's just knocking it down, you know. And he's talking to other people. And, and I go, you know, uh, I'm gonna take a bi- I wonder what Joe will do if I take a bite of his biscuits and gravy right here in front of everybody. So uh, I reach over and I take a bite of his biscuits and gravy. And, and he looked at me. And I, he didn't smile at all. He just looked at me. I could tell he was a little tired. I think we had a test that morning or something. And he looked at me. He said, Chuck, don't touch my food. And there was just kind of this look, you know. Don't touch your food. All right, I got it. So uh, we went back to talking, and we were kind of messing around, and, and uh, he was eating, and he was doing something else, and I thought, you know, we'll just see how, how much a little per- further I can push that. So I took another big bite of his biscuits and gravy, and he looked at me again, and he said, he said, Chuck, I'm serious. Don't touch my food. And I could tell there was, I could tell he was closer to the breaking point than I'd ever pushed him before. <laughs> I could just, there was a sense in which he was closer to a line we had never crossed. And, and we'd gone, you know, we'd done some stuff and we'd gotten, you know, we were good friends. And, but we were at a line, I could just sense there was a, a line that we had never crossed before. And uh, so we were going around again and I took one more bite of his food and he said, Chuck, you touch my food one more time and I'm going to stab you with my fork. And I remember the look in his eye and the, in, in his face and the intensity of that look and I just remember thinking, I think he'll do it. I just remember thinking, I, I think he'll actually stab me with his fork. And, uh, you know, and, and, and for a moment, reason took over. And I thought, you know what, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. You know, like, if he stabs me in the cafeteria, you know, it could not be good, and I might get angry, and then I might punch him, and this could just all go bad. It's just not worth it. You know what, probably need to leave his food alone. And so... For a couple minutes, I kind of forgot about it, put it away, doing my own thing. And I just happened to glance over at his food, and and he had his fork deep inside of his mouth. And he just looked satisfied and happy, and I just saw one more bite. There was like one last bite on his plate, and I just thought, nah. Then I thought, yeah. So I went and got it with everything I had. I scooped it up. I ate it up. And he looked at me, and he pulled that fork out of his mouth. And he took a swipe at me with it. And uh, there was a whole bunch of people. So I tried to back up, but I couldn't back up that far. And he kind of grazed my arm. And he pulled back. And then he went right in. And he hit me right in the forearm with the fork. And it kind of, you know, it hit like, like wood for a second. And then it like, just went right in. Slid in like butter. Slid right into my arm. And all of a sudden, there was gravy and blood running down my forearm. And everybody at the table had missed the whole interaction. Everyone was like, Joe, what are you doing? You're killing What are you stabbing him for? Like, and everyone was just like, oh, Joe, I can't believe you did that. And all these girls were like, Joe, you're such an idiot. What are you doing stabbing somebody? Nobody knew that I had been pushing <laughs> his buttons. But, but I was I, kind of an instigator. And what's interesting is Jesus intentionally instigates a response in the passage we're coming to. Now, it's wholesome and it's spiritual and it's godly and it's not sinful in any way. But, but it's very intentional. It's very intentional, and it's with two groups of people. I want you to check this out in John chapter 5. Jesus is looking for a response. He wants to exert his authority. He wants to act in a way, and he's, he's looking for a response. He's going to stir up a response. John chapter 5, this is um, the healing at the pool at Bethesda. And after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda. And it had five roof colonnades or five roofed porches. In other words, there were a lot of, um, there was some covering there. So there was this pool at the north side of the temple and it was covered so that if you couldn't get around or if you were homeless, you could could get some cover from the rain and the elements under this five roofed colonnade. 
And in there laid a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? We're going to come back to that in a second. And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. You may have a note in your Bible that talks about an angel who would get in the water and stir up the water. Um, That's not in our older manuscripts. And if you have questions about that, you can ask me later. But um, the water would be disturbed in some way and, and people would try to get to the water. And Jesus said to him, it's interesting, he said, do you want to be healed? The guy says, hey, I got nobody. It's amazing how Jesus doesn't go, well, you know, you got somebody. I mean, it's not like you have nobody. The king of the universe is standing here. He doesn't, it's interesting. He just, what Jesus doesn't say, he goes, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man is healed before he did anything. And he took up his bed and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. That is the key part of this whole verse. Now that day was the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus could have healed somebody any day. Jesus could have gone down to the colonnades where there were a whole bunch of blind and lame and paralyzed people laying there. He could have gone to any day of the week. He could have, anytime he wanted. He woke up on the Sabbath. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go down. It's a Sabbath. I'm going to walk down to the Sabbath. I'm going to heal somebody. And he knew, exa- he knew that that would immediately cause a reaction. So the Jews, and every time you see the Jews, you need to think the religious leaders. When it doesn't talk about the religious leaders, it'll say the crowds. So he said, the Jews said to the man who had been healed, hey, it's the Sabbath, and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Now that's really interesting because in the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was you couldn't do your employment. In other words, keeping the Sabbath meant you would do your job, you would do your work, you would work the land, you would do the harvest, you would do all that work, but on the Sabbath, you need to stop doing your job. Now, rabbis and rabbinical tradition came along, and uh, just like anything that's human, thought we can make that better. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to add 39 categories of work. And apparently one of them is you can't carry your mat when you haven't been able to walk for 38 years. This is ridiculous. So there's this guy that everybody knows hasn't been able to move around or walk. And the religious people are, quite ironically, not resting because they're out there looking for people. And their biggest thing is this guy's carrying his mat. But he couldn't walk. That's some spiritual blindness. If you you don't think that there's such a thing called spiritual blindness, that's spiritual blindness. And and so they get, hey man, you you are breaking the Sabbath. And it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered to them, the man who healed me, that man. And that's interesting. What we don't see from the guy is he doesn't go, he doesn't go, "Ah, I can walk. It's amazing. Oh, you won't believe it. No, he immediately is like, I don't know what you're talking about. That guy, there's some dude who told me I had to carry it. It's amazing. In other words, this guy immediately has other motivations. Like, he just got healed, and, is, and he's trying to dodge the conflict almost immediately. That man, the man who said, take up your bed and walk, and they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Now, that's odd to me. We're going to come back to that in a second, but, but this whole dialogue that Jesus has had with this guy, the guy never looked up at him. We'll come back to that in a second. But he never looked up at Jesus. Not one time. That's really interesting. And we'll come back to that in a second. And Jesus found him in the temple and said to him later, See your wealth, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. He chose, you know, Jesus could have been like, Hey, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm God. And uh, I can heal a lot of people anytime I want. And let's just not stir up a lot of trouble with religious people. Let's be patient with them. And let's just not heal anybody on the Sabbath. Yeah, let's just wait till Monday. Yeah, let's just hang out. No, he intentionally chose the Sabbath to mess with somebody. And I like that. 
Me and Jesus might have been, you know, we might have had fun together. You know, we might have, we might have got along. And then he would have been like, okay, Chuck, now that is wrong. You can't push him like that. But, no, he chooses the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them. And they were persecuting him. Verse 16, they were persecuting him because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father's working until now and I'm working. And this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. In other words, he was, peak, he was picking their sacred cow, their thing that they said, we're, we're so faithful to God, we've got 39 ways you can't work. When, you know, when the Bible came out, when the Old Testament was written, it said you can't work, don't do your job. We're so spiritual now, we love God so much. We, we, we've, we've done this, we've, we've figured it out so much. We, we've extended that to 39 things, 39 ways you can't breathe and sneeze. Because we love God that much. And God's going, I'm in charge of that. In fact, this is a reference probably all the way down to Psalms 121 where it says, The Lord who takes care of you doesn't sleep and he doesn't slumber that's good news by the way that's good news but there's a reaction and and, and what's been threatened here it's the, the thing that's been threatened is the place where the religious leaders have control and they're guarding it they're they, they're in control and they're guarding it and jesus comes right in and he says i'm the lord of the sabbath he'll say in other places i don't have to keep the sabbath by the way See, that's good news because, see, the Sabbath is created for the man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a reminder to every human being who's broken and sinful and that we have to sleep, that we have to rest, that we are not sovereign, that we are not in control, that we can't go and go and go and go and go and be productive every day of our lives. The Sabbath reminds us that we're not king. And what reminds us that he's king is he doesn't have to sleep. He only slept one time, and that was in the day seven of creation when it said, He rested after all of creation. It's the only time we have in the whole Bible where it says that God rested. In fact, if you flip over to Psalms 127, it says that, hey, if you try to build your house on your own, you're doing it in vain. If you toil and labor and get up early and go to bed late, guess what? If I'm not working, nothing's going to happen. And then it says, but the Lord gives those he loves rest. And what's, what's ironic is in their, in their control of the Sabbath, they're actually not resting. And when Jesus threatens that by healing somebody on that sacred day, he's saying to them, you're not in control of the Sabbath. I am. Now, we should pause there for a second because you're going, okay, that's cool. I'm not all that bent out about the, sh- the Sabbath. In fact, you know, I go to church about twice a month, actually, because that's just how much I'm not that bent out of shape about it. I sleep in some Sundays. See, no big deal. The Sabbath's not a big sacred cow for me. It's fine. Like, you know, whatever you do, you know, whatever. The Sabbath is fine. In fact, some of us even work on the Sabbath. That's cool. I'm not all bent out of shape about it. But I, but I bet you that there's some part of your life and you're Walk with God where you've kind of grabbed control and you said, see, I'm doing it right. There it is. And God would say, I've, I've got authority over that. You, you, need, you need to kind of let your hand go of that. I'm in charge of the way that's going to work out. You're all bent out of shape about the way someone acts that way or dresses in that way or does that thing. And, and I just want you to know I'm in control. I'm king over that. Now, I don't know what that is for you. There, there are things like that in my life uh, because I'm sometimes a control freak. I want to be in control. I want everything working around me. I, I like to work and be anxious and be in control of all the things that are happening around me. And it's a little bit frustrating when God steps into my life and he goes, you're not in control of any of that. All those things you work and stress out about and organize and fight over and lose sleep over and get anxious about it. All that heartburn because you can't sleep at night. I'm in control of all of that. Jesus, Jesus loves to uncover what's really going on in our heart. And he, and he does it with these religious leaders. Now, we, we, we like that because we, we don't really like religious people all that much. So we're like, yeah, go Jesus, get them, make them mad, stick it to them. But I want you to know that Jesus is also dealing with another person in this story. And while this person may seem way less religious, and this person may seem outwardly way more broken, this person also needs to react to Jesus. And Jesus is also getting a reaction out of him. I want to go back and look at this with this guy. 
Because it might, might, it might be a little bit surprising to see that Jesus puts his finger right on this guy too. And he exerts his authority into his life as well. And he demands a response from him that is equally as offensive as what he did with the religious leaders. It's just in a different way. And that's good because some of us might not be all that all tied up about things we're trying to control. We might have other things that we do not want to submit to the lordship and to the authority of Christ. So he comes to this guy, we go back to it, and he's been sitting there for 38 years. That's a long time. That's a long time to not be able to do what you want. That's a long time to allow bitterness to kind of creep in your heart. That's a long time to be sitting there without hope in the world. 38 years waiting year after year. We don't know if he was born that way. There may be indications that he wasn't born that way later. But we don't know. And we don't know if he's paralyzed or if he's just super, super sick. But Jesus knew. Jesus saw him and Jesus knew and he knew he'd been there for a long time. And he asked him, do you want to be healed? Now, that seems like an obvious, like there should be an obvious answer to that question. But I want you to know, do you notice he doesn't say yes? It's not like, you know, other guys that Jesus encounters that have heard of Jesus coming from a long way off, that have that been laying there going like, hey, there's Jesus. It's not like the woman tracking Jesus going, man, if I could just grab his garment, I would be healed. There's nothing like that with this guy. In fact, we know later because the religious leaders are like, who are you talking about? And he goes, I don't know. That means when Jesus said, do you want to be healed? This guy was so down, so despondent, so unhappy, he never even looked up. He didn't care who Jesus was. He, wasn't, he didn't have it on his radar that maybe there was this guy named Jesus coming to town for the, past, or for the religious feast, whatever it was. We don't know what feast it was. He just doing his own thing, bitter and angry and tired and hopeless. And I know that everybody in the room has areas of our life where it is possible to get bitter and angry and hopeless. We all have those parts of our lives. And, and his is super obvious. He's had to wait for 38 years. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And the, and the guy, is, he's a little bit annoyed. He goes, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, somebody else steps in before me. That's interesting, and that would kind of give us a little bit more about this guy. So this not only guy who's like hurting, sick, and down and out, this is a guy who apparently has driven out anybody who might have loved him. You, you ever been so unhappy like that? You ever been in such a place in your life where you are so unhappy, so without hope, so frustrated with life, so bitter, so angry, and maybe your heart has just gotten so hard-hearted that people who used to love you just can't stand to be around you anymore. People who used to want to be there for you, want to fight for you, want to help you, want to strive with you to, 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 to get through it and to fight through it are, are like, you know what? You just, why don't you just mope on your own now? Because people have a limit to how much that they can handle. See, it wouldn't be normal in that culture if, if you had a relative who was paralyzed to go, hey, let's just throw this person out and leave them alone. That wouldn't be normal. No, you, you took care of your people. You took care of your family. It was that kind of culture, right? You, you, didn't, you didn't wait for the, uh, anybody else. You, there wasn't a government program out there to help the homeless, and you didn't, so you didn't rely on any of that kind of stuff. You took care of your family. You took care of your people. If you had a leper for a sister and that she had to live outside the village, you went and fed her. You went and tried to make things as comfortable as possible. So for the guy to say, I have no one, says so not only is he sick, not only is he hurting, but he's been abandoned. That's exactly right. He's been abandoned. And we don't really know why, but I, I wonder if some of us could go, yeah, I, I've been there. Yep, nobody wants to talk to me anymore. Nobody wants to invite me out on Friday night anymore because I'm so unhappy. I'm so bitter. I'm so frustrated. I'm so hopeless. Every time people, you know, you know I'm just tired of your complaining. I, I, you know what, I understand. Your life sucks. It hurts. I get it. But come on. But that's where he's at. He has no one. And Jesus, this is, this is incredible. 
unlike other times where Jesus heals somebody, Jesus doesn't ask him, will you believe? It's really interesting. He doesn't ask him. He doesn't go, hey, do you have faith that I can heal you? He doesn't ask that, right? He doesn't wait for some, some pre-demonstration uh, of confidence in God's power. Like you see with the official who came in chapter 4, who goes, hey, will you heal my son? And Jesus goes, hey, if you believe, you know, and, and he believes, and he goes back, and his son was healed on the very moment that, that Jesus said your son will be healed. Or like the, the woman who grabbed his cloak, he looked at her and he says, your faith healed you. But that's not here. Now, that is super encouraging. Do you know that Jesus can heal you before you have faith? You know that? You know that Jesus has so much grace for you that he doesn't have to wait around for you? No, he can break right into your life, right into your hard-heartedness, right into your bitterness, right into all your pain, and he could say, get up. Before you ever had one word of faith. By the way, that's the gospel Ephesians says. When you were dead in your trespasses and sins, he made you alive. That's the gospel. That's what happens in the gospel. Jesus says, get up. And he didn't activate by some faith by trusting he could get up. He was healed. He knew he was healed. He, never, he didn't move a muscle. He was healed, and he was like, I can get up. And that's awesome. And that's encouraging. And that's grace. And that's grace, and that's beautiful, and, and that would be all super happy if that's where the story ended. Except Jesus still wants to exert, even in this moment, and even with this man, his authority. And we don't like that very much, but Jesus is going to do it anyway. And we have to come to grips with that because it's exactly what Jesus is going to do in our lives every day as we follow him. He's, he's going to speak into our lives and he's going to go, I'm king right there. You've got to give that to me. Nobody else has the right to say stop that, but I do and I'm king. It might even be wrong. Nobody else can even say it's wrong, but I say it's wrong. It's mine. And Jesus is going to do that with this guy. You see this guy, he gets up, the Jews confront him, he says, I don't know who you're talking about, I never even saw him, never even wanted to talk to him, but now I can walk, it's awesome, right? And Jesus finds him in verse 14, and, and, and if you can just step out of re, being a religious person for a second, and just listen to this as someone who maybe read the story for the first time, check out how offensive this would be, unless you just know how true it is. Verse 14, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you're well. Sin no more. Do you know how offensive that is to my heart? Implication? You're a rotten, dirty sinner, Chuck. And I have the right as King Jesus to say, stop it. That flies right in the face of our whole culture. And I don't think just our culture, I think any culture. I think anywhere you go, anywhere in the world, Sinful heart does not want anybody to tell me what I can't do. Or anybody to tell me that maybe some of the pain I've been walking through is my own rebellion. To see, you're well. Go, sin no more. That nothing worse may happen to you. Now, does that mean that he was sick and broken because of sin? We don't know. Is that possible? Yeah. Now, as and, and Jesus answers this question all the time, in fact, he's asked later in chapter 9, they run into a blind guy, and uh, Jesus says, you know, his disciples go, hey, there's this guy, he's blind, he's been blind since he was born. Is that because he sinned or his parents sinned? And Jesus goes, nah, it's not because he sinned, and it's not because his parents sinned. He was born blind, why? For the glory of God to be demonstrated. Okay, so just being born blind or being sick or having pain in your life does not automatically because of sin. Now, in the larger scheme of things, all pain and all suffering is because we live in a broken world broken by sin. So you could say in a larger picture, that's always true. There's going to come a day where there's no more sickness and there's no more brokenness and there's no more suffering and no more pain. That's because God's going to eradicate sin on the last day. But even today, if someone's struggling or someone's hurting, none of us have the right to look at that person and go, you know, if you would just shape up, you wouldn't be hurting like that. We've got to be careful about that. Jesus says, no, you can't do that. You can't look at somebody in pain, someone suffering, and go, yeah, I bet there's some sin. Cause that. 
God's bringing it down in you. But see, that's what Job's friends said to Job, right? Surely you sinned somewhere. Surely you, you were somewhere where you, you just didn't do it right and God brought all this suffering to your life because really deep, deep, deep down, you're a dirty, rotten sinner, Job. Okay, so we can't, we can't go around going, hey, you're hurting, you're suffering. I bet it's because you're a sinner. But we also don't know the heart like Jesus does. See, Jesus has the right to exert his authority into this man's life. And he has the right to say to him, hey, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. In other words, sin may have contributed to this or it may not have, but you're a dirty, rotten sinner. You're, you're broken. You're messed up. There is rebellion in your heart. You are not some wholesome, faith-filled guy. And again, that's super encouraging because I'm no better than that, and you're no better than that. We're not the heroes of the story. We're the broken, lame, paralyzed, blind people in the story. And except by the grace of God who comes up to us when we were his enemies, Ephesians says, he came to us when we were his enemies and called us alive, showed us love, and redeemed us. And he has kingly authority to say to us, go and sin no more. That right there, you've got to let it go. It's mine. That anger, it's mine. That lust, it's mine. Those things that you say, well, that's just my preference. I can do what I want. It's my choice. It's mine. I'm king. Nobody else is king over your life. But Jesus is king over your life. And he speaks clearly through his word. And what will we do when he exerts his authority? What will we say when he steps into our lives? And I want to tell you, it's so offensive that even if you had been broke down like this guy, it's not automatic to respond to that question and go, well, you healed me, duh, I'm going to sin no more. Some people did. Some people didn't. Isn't that mind-blowing? Isn't that crazy? Some people were healed by Jesus, told to sin no more, and went and became an informant. In fact, that's what this guy seems to do. In fact, he doesn't respond at all to the claim, the, the, the command by Jesus to sin no more. No, he says he went away and he went straight back to the religious leaders, the Jews. And he said, yeah, the guy who really broke the Sabbath, you were kind of getting on to me because I was carrying the mat. But please don't get on to me because the guy you really need to get is Jesus. I actually just found him. I hadn't talked to him earlier because I was doing my own thing. Wasn't really paying attention. Kind of super excited. I was walking now. I don't really care who did it. But now I know if you want to get him, he's over there. That happened all the time when Jesus interacted with people. There were some people that were touched by Jesus and by his power and his command to submit and to follow and to come under under his kingly rule. There were some people who said, yes, that's what I want. That's where freedom is. That's where I want to be is under your rule and under your reign and under your hand and under your authority. That's where I want to be. And there were others who were healed dramatically and went right to the authorities and said, hey, I know where Jesus is if you want to get him. It happens throughout the New Testament. Because we, in our sinful state, don't like the authority of Jesus. Because it says to us, like it says to the religious people, hey, this stuff you think you're in control of, I'm king of that. You've got to let it go. That Sabbath issue that's your issue that you, you've built walls around and control issues around and you're anxious and you're fighting and actually you're supposed to be resting under my power and under my authority, but you're just trying to grip it with everything you got. I'm king over that. You got to let it go, Chuck. Oh, hey, that, that area of autonomy and sin and rebellion against me and my word, then I'm king over that too. I'll heal you even before you even believe in me. I'll move into your life with power even before you do anything. I'll show you grace and love and mercy, but my authority is still my authority. You have to come under my leadership and under my authority. And that's hard for anybody to do because we are broken, sinful people. So the question this morning is, what is Jesus instigating in your life? What is he stirring up in you? What is he, where is he pushing you to your limits in your life, trying to get a reaction to see what's really in your heart? Where is he coming after you? Where is he coming after your control issues? Where is he coming after your lack of peace? Where is he coming after that hidden sin that nobody else knows about? Or maybe other people know about it, but you defend it because you think it's my right to do what I want. 
I can spend my money, my money the way I want. I can do what I want when I want because I am me. I'm autonomous. I'm the king of my universe. You can be healed that way, but you will not live free because the only way to live free is to live under the authority of Jesus. So I think that's, that's kind of the question that comes to us this morning. Is how are we going to respond? When Jesus steps in, when Jesus begins to speak to us about his authority and his rule and his reign, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to respond to it? And the beautiful thing is that in both cases, he offers grace. That the Father works and we rest is grace. That's grace. That's beautiful. Praise God, you work and I don't have to. I don't have to be in control. That's grace. And the fact that he would step into my life and highlight areas that bring destruction and pain and say, you have to let that go, Chuck. That's grace. And what we find out even more is that the Holy Spirit comes into every believer. He doesn't just say, go and sin no more. He actually comes in and begins to activate inside of us the ability to say no to the flesh and yeah. yes to Christ. Yeah. But it all comes under his authority. So what are we going to do with that this morning, Mosaic? Jesus, we love you, and we need you, and we desperately want to be king of our own lives. That's because we're sinners. There may, some, there may be something in our lives that's huge and everybody knows about, or there may be something that nobody knows about. It doesn't matter. You say, I'm king. You say, me and the Father are Lord. We're Lord over the Sabbath. We're Lord over the things you want to be in control of. And we're Lord over your life. Jesus, we want to submit to your Lordship in our lives. We want to repent. We want to live in the freedom that comes being part of your kingdom and under your hand. In Jesus' name, amen.